Matthew chapter 28. It's been a tremendous series. Enjoyed the, uh, the missionaries that we've been able to study. And uh, pray that the Lord blesses us again today. Uh, we're going to be looking at, or going to be talking about John Patton, John G. Patton. Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> and before I get started, let me uh, just make a recommendation to, to all of you. I would strongly recommend to you that you read a biography about a missionary. Because I think I can speak for those of us that have been teaching during this series that we've enjoyed and we've gotten much more out of the study of these missionaries than you probably have. Um, just th that, that's what happens anytime you study anything. Uh, you get more than the, the end listener. And uh, I, I would encourage all of you to, uh, to pick up a biography uh, of some missionary, well-known or not well-known, and, and read it, and your Christianity will, will be the better for it, uh, almost guaranteed. So Matthew chapter 28, we'll just read verse 20 and then we'll get going. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Uh, this was the life verse of John Patton, and particularly the end of the verse where it says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And as you'll hear today, uh, this, this certainly was a verse that rung true uh, in John Patton's life. And it was not some token appreciation for the presence of God, but it was a, it was a precious promise that John Patton clung to in some of the most frightening situations. In 1774, one of the great explorers of history, James Cook, discovered an island chain in the South, uh, South Pacific Ocean, which he named the New Hebrides Islands. I think there's about 80 islands. About 65 of them are inhabited. And that name stuck until 1980. Now those islands are called Vanuatu. Vanuatu. And uh, just to give you an idea where they are, if you were to draw a line from Sydney, Australia to Hawaii, and you were to travel along that line, you would come across... Uh, the Republic of Vanuatu, these, uh, these New Hebrides Islands. As far as we know, there was no Christian influence on the New Hebrides Islands until 1839. 1800 years with no Christian influence. In 1839, there was a missionary named John Williams. John Williams had already uh, experienced successful ministry in the South Sea Islands among some different island chains, uh, about 20 years worth. Uh, John Williams, along with James Harris, went ashore at Aero Manga, which is an island that belongs to the New Hebrides, uh, to try to preach the gospel there. But within minutes, they were clubbed to death, they were cooked, and they were eaten before the boat that brought them there had even departed. In 1858, just 19 years later, John Patton would arrive on the New Hebrides Islands uh, to preach the gospel there. John Patton was born on May 24th, 1824 in a small cottage home near uh, Dumfries, Scotland. His parents were James and Janet Patton, and he was the firstborn of five sons and six daughters in the Patton home. His parents were devout Presbyterians. In Patton's autobiography, it becomes clear at the very beginning that his parents, and particularly his father, played a huge role, had a huge impact on his ending up on the mission field. Patton describes a small room in his family's home, uh, which they called the sanctuary, the closet, uh, the sanctuary closet. It wasn't much bigger than a walk-in closet, but Patton describes how that multiple times a day his father would go into that sanctuary, or that closet as they called it, and would pray, and would pray for his children, would pray for the heathen. And Patton describes being able to hear the echoes and the groans that, uh, that came from that room. He describes the impact that, that his father's prayers in, those closet, in that closet had upon him in later years. And he puts it this way. He said, Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of memory or blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to those early scenes and shut itself up once again in that sanctuary closet. And hearing still the echoes of those cries to God would hurl back all doubt with the victorious appeal he walked with God, why may not I? And it's apparent one of the sources of courage, one of the motivations for faithfulness in Patton's later life 
was his father's walk with God. Patton's father, John, John's father, wanted to be a minister himself. But when he realized that that was not his calling in life, determined that if it was the Lord's will, he would raise up all of his sons to be ministers. And three of his sons ended up in the ministry. Uh, he again describes his father's prayers in family worship. They had family worship twice a day. And he describes his father's prayers in that scene. And he says this, How much my father's prayers at this time impressed me I can never explain, nor could any stranger understand. When on his knees and all of us kneeling around him in family worship, he poured out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world to, to the service of Jesus as we rose from our knees, I used to look at the light on my father's face and wish I were like him in spirit, hoping that in answers to his prayers, I might be privileged and prepared to carry the blessed gospel to some portion of the heathen world. And it was from a young age that John Patton decided he was going to be a missionary. And you know, just to stop the, the narrative here, sometimes his parents can be difficult uh, to see the influence that we have upon our children. Uh, but take this lesson from history that your level of Christianity will deeply impact uh, your children. Is it a coincidence that John Patton went to the mission field when his father poured out his heart for the mission field? Is it a coincidence that John Patton had unwavering faith in God when his father had unwavering faith in God? You know, we as parents, we may not be called ourselves to carry the gospel to the world, but we may be training the next generation of, of people that will carry the gospel to the world. When John was about 23 years of age, he moved to Glasgow, uh, where he began theological and medical training to, to become a missionary. And he began teaching in a, a small, small school. He then became what, what he called a city missionary, what they called a city missionary, and he would travel door to door uh, distributing tracts like, like our regular door to door ministry, probably a little more extensive than that. I think he did it like four, to, four hours a day. Uh, and, and, and in this city mission work, he, he started several Bible classes uh, and different various uh, classes to help the poor. Uh, and he was there until 34 years of age. This ministry, uh, at first, it struggled to get off the ground, couldn't get uh, many people, more than maybe a dozen or a handful. Uh, to show up to his regular Bible studies. But eventually it flourished, and when he left uh, that city mission work, uh, he was having average attendance of 500 to 600 people on a near daily basis uh, to his meeting. Uh, while enjoying this ministry, uh, he heard on many occasions uh, the perish of the per perishing souls in the South Sea Islands. And realizing that there were not many who were willing to go, John Patton began to pray if the Lord would send him to the South Sea Islands. On one occasion, the Reformed Presbyterian Church, which, which that's what Patton was, he was a Presbyterian, uh, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland uh, was trying to recruit help to join Joe Inglis uh, in the New Hebrides Islands. And it was to this call that John Patton responded and obeyed the call of God. And he told a fellow student at the time, of his decision to go to the New Hebrides Islands, and to which his friend uh, responded, if they will accept of me, I also am resolved to go. Now this, this decision to go to the New Hebrides Islands was met with uh, much criticism and much disapproval. One of the arguments against Patton uh, going to the New Hebrides Islands was his current successful ministry. Why leave a successful ministry that you're enjoying now to go to... Uh, the heathen who, who very well may in fact kill you as soon as you get there. Why would you do such a thing? And, and observing scripture, it becomes clear that God does sometimes move people from a successful ministry uh, to a, a more barren uh, field or, or, or other, another area of ministry. I think of Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 8, enjoying a, a wonderful revival in Samaria. And God calls him away to deal with one man uh, in the desert. So God certainly uh, can lead however He pleases. Patton tells of, of, of a Mr. Dixon uh, who opposed his going to uh, the cannibals. And when he, when, he, when he was told, Mr. Dixon was told that Patton was going to the cannibals, uh, he said, the cannibals, you will be eaten by the cannibals. To which John Patton responded, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. 
I confess to you that if I can but live and die in serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. You know, to make a statement like that, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. It requires a certain fortitude that, that is, is really missing in modern day Christianity. And it seems <clears throat> at this time that the opposition was so strong to Patton going to the New Hebrides Islands that he actually began to doubt whether or not it was the call of God to go to the mission field, to the New Hebrides. And again, at this juncture, we see the influence of Patton's parents, even in his adulthood, because uh, he says, uh, he, says he, he writes this, uh, on meeting with so many obstructing, uh, obstructing influences, I again laid the whole matter before my dear parents, and their reply was to this effect. Heretofore, we, we feared to bias you, but now we must tell you why we praise God for the decision to which you have been le led. Your father's heart was set upon being a minister, but other claims forced him to give it up. When you were given to them, your father and mother laid you upon the altar, their firstborn, to be consecrated, if God saw fit, as a missionary of the cross. And it has been their constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, and led to this very decision. We pray with all our heart that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, and give you many souls from the heathen world for your hire. From that moment, every doubt as, as to my path of duty forever vanished. I saw the hand of God very visibly, not only preparing me for, but now leading me to the foreign mission field. And mind you, that Patton's parents know where he's going. They know he's going to minister to the cannibals. And they certainly have, almost certainly have heard about John Williams and James Harris, who less than 20 years before uh, went to this same island chain and were brutally murdered immediately upon stepping foot upon the island. And yet their willingness to let their son go to such a field is, is exemplary. Uh, it's, it's exemplary to me. And it's almost as exemplary as John Patton's courage uh, once he gets to the New Hebrides. On April 16th, 1858, John Patton and his wife Mary set sail for the New Hebrides Islands. On August 30th of the same year, they arrived at Anetium, I'm sure I'm butchering that, pronounce, uh, that pronouncement, but Anetium, the southernmost island in the New Hebrides uh, Islands. Their missionary, John Getty, had already been working and, and had established a great work. And I'm not sure if he had at, at this point, but, but he was well along the way of, of, of turning Anetium into a mostly Christian island, had a great work going there. While they were at Anetium, uh, they received some training and building and that sort of thing. And then they chose their island that they would go to. They were only there uh, for a few months. And they chose the island of Tana, Tana in the New Hebrides. Another couple, the Mathesons, would set up a station on the south side of the island of, of, the new, of Tana. And the Patons would set up shop at Port Resolution on Tana. Though this should not be, this shouldn't be confused that their being on the same island meant that they could you know, share communion with one another. They were, they were worlds apart. It was almost impossible to get from one side of the island to the other. So it was essentially like them serving on two different, two different islands. The Patons were, uh, were, were essentially alone other than the, uh, the, the teachers that came with them from Anetium. Patton and his wife landed on Tana in November of 1858. And on February 12th of the following year, just a few months later, uh, the Pattons had a son whom they named Peter Robert after Mary's father. But the joy of this new life was met with almost immediate sorrow of death because on March 3rd, Mary uh, died of ague and fever. And it wasn't that much later that young Peter got sick and died on March 20th. So here John Patton has just arrived on the New Hebrides Islands, and four months after getting there, he's buried his wife and his daughter. Incredible sacrifice. And when reading his autobiography and just thinking about it now, my eyes almost well up because you can almost sense the loneliness, the, the, the not bitterness, but, but the, the, the loneliness and the sorrow uh, that John Patton endured. And I can't imagine being in John Patton's shoes in that moment. You just left a successful ministry for Tana, and now you've laid your, your closest family members in the ground. He endured depression, 
loneliness and great sorrow uh, during these trials. Uh, During his time on Tana, uh, John Patton himself would get sick 14 times with ague and fever. And ague and fever was, was the very sickness that took his wife. So you can imagine every time you know, he gets this, this malaria fever that he thinks, you know, is, is this the time? Is this the time that, that my life is going to be extinguished? And, I mean, how, how do you think he felt? How do you, it, it's unbelievable sacrifice. There was no clinic uh, with medicine. Uh, in fact, he was the only doctor, if you want to call him that, on the island. Uh, every time that he got sick, his life was hanging in the balance. And he was essentially alone. As I said earlier, he had some helpers that came from the island of Manetium. But these helpers obviously had a language barrier, had a cultural barrier with John Patton. So to a certain extent, uh, he had some help, but but he was also alone. Uh, 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 He was alone. He was alone. When a European or Australia ship backed out of the harbor, that was the last time that he was going to see a white man uh, uh, for, for some time for as long as he, as he could realize. If that weren't enough, his time on the island of T- Tana, he spent four years on the island of Tana, it was almost totally fruitless. He had very little fruit to show for his labor there. And I don't think I can really describe how dark his time on the island of Tana was. I- I'll try to, but, but his time on Tana was was of unfathomable trials, one after another, from personal tragedy, loneliness, sickness. And on top of that, nearly on a daily basis, and I don't say that to exaggerate what happened, on a near daily basis, Patton's life was in danger. I want you to imagine, again, a place that has been isolated from gospel influence for 1,800 years. Imagine how dark the influence has gone at that point. Imagine the, the stranglehold that Satan has upon such a place. On Tana, women were, were mistreated brutally. Uh, men would carry around with them clubs, and if they were displeased with their wives for any reason, they would, they would immediately start beating their wives and sometimes even kill their wives without uh, any consequences to the man. When a man died, they would oftentimes strangle his wife or his wives Uh, so that she could go to wherever he was and serve him uh, uh, there. On the religious front, these people obviously have no knowledge of the one true God. And uh, as we find in Romans chapter 1, when when man rejects God, he has to replace God. There There is a hole that has to be filled with something. So these islanders who know nothing of God have replaced the one true loving kind God with a religious system of fear, of fear. These islanders were extremely superstitious. Uh, they, anytime they, they dealt with their religion, they were trying to appease an evil spirit. They were trying to maybe exact revenge upon a neighbor, or they were trying to prevent calamity uh, in their life. So it was a religion of, of fear, fear, and nothing else but fear. And they were enslaved to it. On one occasion, John Patton gathered a group at a particular village on that island and began to tell them about love and about sending his son to die for them. And they, they enjoyed this lesson until he told them that they had to give up their, uh, their, their idolatry. And that they were not happy with. And from there they began to persecute John Patton. Uh, then on top of that, on civil matters, uh, there was war on nearly constantly every turn. As soon as they got on the island, uh, their first day on the island of Ta- Tana, they could hear the shouts of war around them. And it didn't, didn't really stop for a long period ever uh, while he was on the island of Tana. Uh, Patton describes these people very, very good at stealing. He says, <clears throat> If an article fell or was seen on the floor, a Tana man would neatly cover it with his foot, while looking you frankly in the face and having fixed it by his toes or by bending in his great toe, look like a thumb to hold it, would walk off with it, assuming the most innocent look in the world. In this way, a knife, a pair of scissors, or any small article would at once disappear. And so these people are morally corrupt. They're morally, uh, they're, they're base people. Think as base as you can be, as you can imagine, and then think uh, base. Or, and, oh, and on, on top of that, they're cannibals. They're cannibals. And then on top of that, you don't speak their language. 
And really, that doesn't matter because these people would rather eat you than speak to you anyways. So that's who John Patton is, is, is dealing with. Again, Patton's life was nearly daily in jeopardy. Uh, after a little while on Tana, he became the most hated man on the island. They absolutely hated John Patton and his religion. Now, they enjoyed his, they enjoyed his medicine and his, his goodwill to the people, but they hated John Patton and his religion. They blamed everything on John Patton. Uh, there was one particular occasion a few weeks after he arrived there that there was no rain began to dry up the crops, and they blamed this on John Patton and his God. Uh, the following Lord's Day, when they were worshiping, rain began to, fell, to, began to fall. And so the people's wrath was appeased until the rain became a hurricane and it destroyed many of their crops, uh, to which they again blamed on John Patton and his God. Patton's ministry consisted of him traveling village to village, preaching the gospel, but it also extended to defending women and, uh, and, and, and as a peacekeeper among uh, the harbor people and the, the inland people. Uh, in his autobiography, Patton noted that he was once able to negotiate peace between the two, uh, the two peoples, and the peace lasted about four weeks, which was an unusually uh, long length of time, to give you an idea of how often they were at war with one another. And besides his ministry, again, his life was, uh, was daily attempted, nearly daily. He tells of one encounter, uh, he, he, this is interesting, he, he says, One morning at daybreak I found my house surrounded by armed men, and in chief intimated that they had assembled to take my life. Seeing that I was entirely in their hands, I knelt down and gave myself, myself away, body and soul, to the Lord Jesus for what seemed like the last time on earth. Rising, I went out to them and began calmly talking about their unkind treatment of me and contrasting it, contrasting it with all my conduct towards them. I also plainly showed them what would be the sad consequences if they carried out their cruel purpose. At last, some of the chiefs who had attended the worship rose and said, Our conduct has been bad, but now we will fight for you and kill all those who hate you. <laughs> so they were fickle people, uh, to say the least. John Patton had the, you could tell from that, that he had a, a certain uh, moxie to, to, to stand up to these people and just say, No, what you were doing is wrong even though they're pointing a musket in his face. He had no problem with, with pointing out that they shouldn't beat their wives, even though they had an axe in their hand and wanted to kill him. He described a day in which a large number of men were at his house just watching Patton, when suddenly a man rushed on Patton with an axe and would have killed him, would have killed him, but a chief stepped in and rescued Patton at the last moment. There was another day where a chief followed Patton around for four hours with a loaded musket pointed at his head. And I, I, I imagine that the pastoral ministry is stressful enough, but <laughs> can you imagine you know, going around making your hospital visits, you know, visiting people, studying, preaching with a man holding a, gus a musket uh, to your head? Uh, certainly an intense situation. And again, his, his autobiography reads like a thriller. I mean, this stuff is, is what movies is made about. It is one encounter after another of, of, of life-threatening situation. Here's another occasion he tells of. <clears throat> one day while toiling away at my house, the war chief, his brother, and a large party of the armed men surrounded the plot where I was working. They all had muskets besides their own native weapons. They watched me for some time in silence, and then every man leveled a musket straight at my head. Escape was impossible. Speech would, have, would only have increased my danger. My eyesight came and went for a few moments, which means he began to faint. I prayed to my Lord Jesus, either himself to protect me or to take me home to his glory. I tried to keep wor working on at my task as if no one was near me. In that moment, as never before, the words came to me, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, I will do it. And I knew that I was safe. Retiring a little from their first position, no word having been spoken, they took up the same attitude somewhat further off, seemed to be urging one another to fire the first shot. My dear, my dear Lord restrained them once again, and they withdrew, leaving me with a new cause for trusting Him with all that concerned me for time and eternity. You get a sense that Patton had unwavering dependence and confidence upon the Lord. And again, why did these people persecute John Patton? They loved his medicine. Uh, they loved how he was fair to them in trade. Uh, but they hated his God and they loved their sin. 
There was one particular occasion where Patton visited a village and taught the people about Jehovah. And after Patton was, was done speaking, three men, whom they call sacred men, essentially witch doctors, stood up and said they didn't believe in Jehovah and that if they could get a hold of a piece of fruit that John Patton had eaten recently, they could kill John Patton. And this was you know, according to their, their witchcraft and their sorcery. So John Patton took this opportunity. He saw a lady with a basket of fruit. He's, he said, ma'am, may I have some of the fruit? So he took three of the fruit. He took a bite out of each of the fruit. And he gave it to each of the sacred men and said, go on, go on. So they did. They tried to kill him with their sorcery. Some, some, I think it was called Nahak is what they called it. And John Patton, I mean, the people are scared to death that he's about to die. And they all, all the people are, are withdrawing back into the, the bush. And John Patton's just standing there watching these, these three sacred men do their, their ritual. And, and almost, I, I, the, the scene that came to my mind was Elijah on Mount Car- Carmel in 1 Kings 18. He literally begins to mock the men during their ritual. He says, I'm, I'm still healthy, I'm, I'm still well. And finally they get done with their ritual and, and they say, well, we need, we need to come back with all of our sacred men, meet on our, our sacred day, and, and then we'll be able to, uh, to kill you. And he said, fair enough, have at it. So he returns home and he says in his autobiography that he, during that week, felt stronger and stronger, not weaker and weaker. So the next week he returns to the same village and the people are astonished, astonished that that this didn't work, that he's still alive and well. And the sacred men had to admit that they could not kill John Patton. Two of the sacred men then sat down and listened to John Patton begin to to teach again. And John Patton in his autobiography is unclear about whether these two men got saved. He leaves it it open. Certainly they were friendly to John Patton the rest of his life, but he doesn't say whether or not they got saved. But the third sacred man went back in the bush, was outraged that this didn't work, grabbed his javelin, grabbed a spear, came back and was, while John Patton's teaching, was waving his spear in the air as if he was about to kill John Patton. I mean, can you imagine, like, we get a little annoyed when a baby starts to cry with the distraction, but if there's a guy in the back waving a spear and he wants to kill you, that's, that's a, a pretty big distraction. And anyway, he continued to teach and, and this man didn't, didn't end up uh, killing him. <clears throat> you would think that such situations on a near daily basis would, would mentally ruin a man. I mean, you, you'd have a nervous breakdown after a while. There was a missionary uh, that came to help the Pat, or Brother Patton. Uh, uh, one Mr. Johnston and his wife came to the island. And one day, Mr. Johnston and Patton were administering medicine uh, to some men. And it was an ambush. The men then tried to kill them. They tried to hit them with clubs. And they narrowly escaped uh, death. Uh, but Mr. Johnston never recovered mentally. And, and within, within a month, Mr. Johnston had passed away. So you look at John Patton, the, 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 the confidence in God that overrides you know, these terrifying situations is, is remarkable. There are a few during his time on Tana, and I'm spending most of my time on Tana, and I'm just going to have to close with, with a very brief summary of the rest of his life. Because he only spent four years on Tana. But, but again, if you read his autobiography, I mean, how can you not put this stuff in, in, this, in this lesson? This stuff's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so Patton, he, he was, uh, there was one chief named Kawia or Kawaya uh, who was converted and once he was converted, he was persecuted and was mercilessly mocked. Uh, this man, Kawhi, was a, was a great comfort to, uh, uh, to Mr. Patton. And around the time that Mr. Johnston died, Patton was severely struck by fever and he was, he was bedridden, couldn't get out of bed. And one day while Patton was sleeping, he woke up to Kawhi praying over him in bed. And Patton records his prayer and it's really gripping. He said... In his prayer, O Lord Jesus, Missy, which, which is missionary, missionary uh, Missy Johnston is dead. Thou hast taken him away from this land. Missy Johnston, the woman, and Miss P- Missy Patton are very ill. I am sick, and thy servants, the Anetiamese, are all sick and dying. O Lord, our Father in heaven, art thou going to take away all thy servants and thy worship from this dark land? What meanest thou to do, O Lord? The Tannies hate thee and thy worship and thy servants, but surely, O Lord, thou canst not forsake Tana and leave our people to die in darkness. 
O make the hearts of this people soft to Thy Word and sweet to Thy worship. Teach them to fear and love Jesus. And O restore and spare Missy, dear Missy Patton, that Tana may be saved. It's a gripping prayer. And it, it, it does show the power of the Gospel to transform the lives of, of cannibals into to people that, that love their people and want to see them saved. But even among these small victories, momentum can never be gained. Because within a few days, Kawaya, or Kawaya was, was dead. He had passed away. Patton held his first baptism on the island of Tana and only baptized the child of, of one of the teachers that had come to help him, one of the anatomy's helpers. But soon after he baptized the child, the child died. And of course, the people, the people blamed Patton and his God for this death. It only raised their, their skepticism. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to skip a lot of this. But in May of, six, of 1861, something else happened on the island of Aramanga. Again, the place where uh, the missionaries were brutally mur murdered about 20 years ago. Uh, in May of 1861, the Gordons, missionaries to Aramanga, uh, were, were brutally murdered, were, were mutilated. Their bodies were mutilated and were martyred uh, for the gospel. They had been serving there for four years, just like John Patton on Tana, but they were martyred. Uh, some of the European trader, traders, and, and I can't give the context because I just don't have time, they hated the missionaries. Uh, the European traders, just to give a little bit of context, they, they would oftentimes, or not oftentimes, but they would sometimes bring some of the, the natives in their ship, intentionally give them the measles, and then, to, then release them back out to their islands. And thousands of people died because of that. And of course, the traders are white people just like the missionaries, so the missionaries get blamed for, the, for what the traders, traders did oftentimes. And the, the, there was a group of Aromangans that came to Tana with the traders and encouraged the Tanamese uh, men to murder the missionaries there on, on the island of Tana. The Tanese men did not do that, they refused to kill them. But at this point, the, the, the intensity, the persecution only, only rose from there because now they were emboldened by other people martyring uh, or murdering the missionaries and, and, and no consequences uh, to their actions. And it was at this point really that, uh, I mean, Patton stayed for a while. I've got I've to really close this, close this down. But it was at this point that, that Patton realized that he probably had to leave the island of Tana. And uh, he, he went to the other side of the island. It's, it's a really remarkable story of how they even got to the other, island of, uh, the other side of the island. They got in a canoe on one occasion, tried to sail around, and uh, battled the Pacific Ocean for four hours, only to land exactly where they departed. So they decided to go by foot, but uh, by foot everybody on the island hated them. So they would cross a village, or they, they really avoided the villages, but they would still cross paths of people uh, who hated them with muskets, and they would oftentimes point them at Patton, and uh, God would, would somehow miraculously keep them from firing the shots. On one occasion, there was a band of warriors that, that followed uh, Patton and his men and, 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 and literally came up around them. So, so Patton and his men, the scene that he describes is just amazing. They're running down this path, and these men, these enemies, are running beside them. They're running beside, almost like escorts. They're running beside him. They don't, they don't end up hurting John Patton for some reason, uh, other than uh, it's obviously the Lord uh, protecting Patton, but it's just, just amazing stuff how he escapes the island of Tana. And, and his time on Tana was, again, fruitless. I mean, the majority of his work was, was, was fruitless. And, and he describes why he believes the Lord had him on Tana in his autobiography, he describes oftentimes while passing through the perils and defeats of my first years in the mission field on Tana, I wondered, and perhaps the reader hereof has wondered, why God permitted such things. But on looking back now, I already clearly perceive, and the reader of my future pages will, I think, perceive, that the Lord was thereby preparing me for doing and providing me materials wherewith to accomplish the best work of all my life, the kindling of the heart of Australian Presbyterianism with a living of affection for these islanders of their own southern seas, and being, being the instrument under God of sending out missionary after missionary to the New Hebrides to claim another island and steal another for Jesus, that work, 
and all that may spring from it in time and eternity never could have been accomplished by me but for the first, but for the first sufferings and then the story of my Tana enterprise. And really, the, the story of Patton, his, his successes as a missionary was not so much on the New Hebrides Islands, but it was in recruiting missionaries to go to the New Hebrides, in lighting a fire in Australia, in Scotland, and even in America for the South Sea Islands. He, after leaving Tana, he went to Australia and Scotland, began telling these stories, and the fire was lit. Missionaries was, were recruited. Patton tried to raise money for a ship. In fact, he, he did raise money for a ship that was going to be used exclusively in the mission work. And the interesting way he went about it was he decided that if every child would give six pence, which is the equivalent nowadays of about 50 cents, if each child would give six pence, they would become little shareholders of this new vessel once it was built. And he raised the money, raised the money for the ship. And once they had built the vessel, the vessel, he had thousands of children out there to see their new, what they were a shareholder of, that new vessel uh, to get the gospel to the New Hebrides Islands. Uh, when he went back to Scotland, he married again, uh, Margaret, in 1864. In 1866, Patton returned to the New Hebrides and established a work uh, on the island of Aniwa, which was the nearest island on Tanna. Um, just to summarize what happened there, the people again were very superstitious, very, very much like the people on Tana. But this time there was a much more prosperous work. God, uh, God blessed Patton's faithfulness. And he, he, was, he was eventually able to lead most of the entire island to the Lord. A remarkable work. Turned it into a, a Christian island. They built an orphanage, a church, a school, some printing offices. In 1899, before Patton died, uh, the Aniwa New Testament was printed. Uh, I believe uh, Patton had a, a big hand in that translation work. Uh, God richly blessed his work. And, and many stories could be told about his time on Aniwa. I'll just tell one, and then I'll try to, to wrap it up. Uh, there was one time, uh, there was a lot of danger on Aniwa as, as well as at Tana, but uh, there was one time where his house was surrounded by, by warriors that, that wanted to kill Patton and his family. And at this point, Patton had a... A, a, a little son on the island. So they were surrounded in their house and their young son escaped from his parents and he went out to the warriors. He began hugging all of the warriors who wanted to kill his family and he, he began scolding them saying, naughty, naughty. <laughs> and it, it quickly turned into uh, these people that wanted to kill John Patton. They, 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 quickly, uh, they quickly got out of there and, and they held the boy on their knee. So the Lord used their little boy uh, to ease the tensions on Aniwa. A great, great man. John Patton died on January 28, 1907 at age of 82, which is a remarkably long uh, span of life, especially considering the circumstances in which he lived. And as he put early in his autobiography, and he put it as sort of a self-fulfilling desire for his life, duties well performed and days well spent. That's John Patton for you. Duties well performed and days well spent. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And thank you for these examples, this example of John Patton, uh, Lord of courage, bravery, of faithfulness to you, of dependence upon you. And I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to, uh, to take these characteristics and to add them to our lives or, or to strengthen them uh, in our lives. Pray that you'd use these stories to light a fire in us for the cause of global missions as well. Pray that you'd now bless the next hour in Jesus' name.